yard. Taken together, these planes would make up the second largest air force in the entire world. But most of these planes will never fly again. They're here to serve a different purpose. The Boneyard is where the Air Force and every other U.S. government agency sends their decommissioned airplanes to be taken apart, reused in other aircraft, or turned over to the Defense Reutilization and Marketing Office to be sold as scrap. The reclamation process at AMARG is able to extract the very last tax dollars from these aircraft after they've reached the end of their useful operational lives. It's a mission that's been helping save taxpayers money since the end of World War II. Shortly after the Second World War, um, there were huge quantities of surplus aircraft scattered all over the world. A lot of them were scrapped where they were in theater, depending on the types. Other airframes were identified as having value for potential future use, or there just wasn't enough capacity in the overseas theaters to, to dispose of them uh, as required. So a lot of them were, were ferried back here. Uh, in particular at Arizona, uh, a lot of B-17s, B-24s, and B-25s were all located here. In the 50s was kind of a, a unique golden age of jet flight and propeller flight. There was an enormous diversity of aircraft being used by, by the Air Force, uh, some more successfully than others. So uh, a lot of them were rapidly outclassed and made obsolete. So, you know, entire production runs of aircraft were brought here for reclamation, like F-84s, uh, B-36s, whereas others were brought here for storage and regeneration. A lot of B-29s were stored here after World War II, and they were pressed back into service for Korea. So up until the early early 60s, AMARC was principally an Air Force facility. Uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps maintained their own facility up outside Phoenix at Litchfield Park. Uh, but that was closed up, I think, in 1962, and all those assets transferred down here. So since that time, this has been the complete storage facility for government aircraft. So you find NASA aircraft over there, you find Coast Guard aircraft, Border Patrol, Navy, Marine, Reserve units, training units. We have a lot of unique airframes here, a lot of uh, one-of-a-kinds or few-of-a-kinds. Behind us here, there's a B-36 Peacemaker. It's special. It um, is the last production one ever built by, by Convair. Uh, came off the assembly line in 1958, flew for two years, retired out in, in Fort Worth. It's one of only four existing airframes out of nearly 400 built. One of my personal favorites is the Boeing B-52A um, Stratofortress. It's the oldest buff in existence, a serial number three. Uh, third one off the production line. Uh, it was the principal uh, test airframe um, and carrier mothership for the X-15 program. So nearly all of the early Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo astronauts all dropped off of our uh, off of our B-52A uh, in the X-15 program. Uh, the recently deceased uh, Neil Armstrong was a participant of that program and dropped off our airplane. So it's to my eyes, it's kind of reeking in history. I, I, I really love it. <laughs> As the Air Force has evolved, so has the Boneyard. During the Cold War, America's determination to outpace the Soviet Union in the space race helped fuel an explosion of technological advancement. Almost as quickly as they were introduced, U.S. military aircraft were regularly phased out as newer aircraft flew faster, higher, and farther. The outmoded airplanes were sent here, and the Boneyard's inventory began to swell. With the Vietnam War came a renewed call for even more advanced bombers and fighters. By the time that war started to wind down in 1973, the Boneyard's fleet had reached an all-time high of more than 6,000 aircraft. Today, some 4,000 aircraft still sit in the Boneyard, in various stages of the reclamation process. But the inventory here, much like in today's Air Force, is destined to change. You know, as our Air Force becomes more and more technologically reliant, um, fewer and fewer different types of airframes are being produced. Um, I would expect probably in 20 or 25 years, you'd probably see less than a thousand aircraft over there and looking out 40 years, there may not be a need for such a large facility. There will always be a need for the facility, but whether or not you're going to find fleets of KC-135s or fields of F-15s, 
Probably not. You know, there's 200 some odd F-22s. You know, the F-35 hasn't even really come into full operational service yet. So I wouldn't expect to see any of them even twinkling at retirement for 35 or 40 years. You know, but there are probably several hundred of them. So it's it's not going to be the same vast, diverse fleet that you see now. So, you know, it is kind of the end of a golden age, you know. Over the course of its more than 60-year history here in the American Southwest, AMARG has become something of an aviation enthusiast's mecca. Wherever you go in the world, anybody who kind of is interested in aviation or airplanes at all, if you mention Tucson, you know, their eyes are like, oh, that's where the boneyards are, right? I, yeah, yeah, that's where the boneyards are. And the boneyards are here for a very good reason. Turns out the desert climate here in Tucson provides an ideal environment for long-term storage of these aircraft with very little risk of corrosion or other damage from the elements. The ground we're on here uh, is, is fairly unique. It's, it's a very high calcium soil, very stable. When it's dry as it is now, it's as hard as concrete and very, very, very robust. And with the dry weather conditions here, low relative humidity year round, very low rainfall, averaging about six to eight inches a year in the region, there's nothing like uh, tornadoes or hurricanes or that type of thing here to potentially destroy assets. So Tucson was identified as an ideal location for an active reclamation 